when you come and see the empty tomb, you will see that only Jesus, who rose from the dead, never to die again, can actually give you eternal life. Come and see the empty tomb. Somebody probably is asking by now, well, Michael, why is the empty tomb such a big deal? Well, it's not just a big deal. <laughs> it's the biggest deal of all. It's the biggest deal of all. Why? Well, think with me, okay? I just want you to think. Think with me. Jesus is no ordinary man. He was God in human flesh. Before his incarnation, Jesus coexisted in the, in the Holy Trinity, in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, God the Son, is equal to God the Father. And so think about this. Think about the incalculable, the unprecedented, the inexplicable, and we won't really understand until we go to heaven, the incredible humility that he sets aside the splendor and the glory of heaven and come and, and, and be born as an embryo in a virgin's womb in order to help us relate to God the Father. So we understand he's been through everything that we've been through so that whomsoever, whomsoever comes and accepts that death, his death on the cross to be the payment for their sin and that his resurrection is assurance of our own resurrection, they can be re reconciled to God the Father. But not just any reconciliation, we are began be called the children of God. I hear some politicians sometimes, you know, pandering, oh, we're all the children of God. And I said, no, ignoramus. <laughs> we're not all the children of God. Humanity, not all the children. We are God's creation. We are created by God. We are created in God's own image. We are created with rational minds, to, and we are created with a free will. We are all created with the capacity to relate to the Almighty God when we come to Him through Jesus Christ. Yes, but not the children of God. Only those who have accepted the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be for them can be called the children of God. And so when you come to see the empty tomb, you will see this unprecedented humility on the part of God and the part of the one who wants to save you, who wants to save you. He wants to save you. But then there's something else you're going to see when you come and see the empty tomb. In fact, this is something I've been preaching about for the last three messages. Download them from apostles.org and follow. Talking about the cross. Think about this. The sinless Pure, holy, that is, he never sinned in thought, word, or deed, hanging on that cross, carrying the horror and the filth of my sin and the sin of everyone who comes to him in repentance and confession. In fact, 700 years before the cross, 700 years before the cross, the prophet Isaiah in 52.5, he prophesied with meticulous precision about the cross. Here's what he said, talking about Jesus. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. All was laid on him. The thing you will see when you come and see the empty tomb, you'll see what I and millions of others around the world, believers, the fact that we become aware of the horror of sin, of the nature of sin, and we develop hatred towards sin. Listen, before I came to Christ, I loved sin. But when I came to Christ, I hate sin. And you know what? I hate sin in my own life more than anybody else's. Because I'm going to give an account of every word that comes out of my mouth. Something else you need to know that when you come to see the empty tomb, 
you'll understand that we all, every one of us, everyone here, everyone watching, every one of us, we will physically die. There's some people running around kind of head in the sand thinking you're going to live forever. Read my lips. No. There's a day that is coming when we'll be separated from our loved ones. We'll be separated from our friends. We'll be separated from familiar surroundings. We'll be separated from our possessions. But we become realistic when you come and see the empty tomb. When you come and see the empty tomb of Jesus, you will see our mortality, our physical mortality. But far more importantly is that you will see life beyond the grave. You will see the necessity of spending this life preparing for the life to come This life may be 50, 60, 100 years, but it's short in comparison to eternity. Eternity is a long, 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 long time. You will see the importance of knowing right now whether you will spend eternity in heaven with the resurrected Jesus or in hell with Satan and his demons. Now, so many preachers don't want to offend people they don't want to talk about hell. But you know what they're doing? It's like a doctor who sees cancer and says, oh, I don't want to offend you. I'm not going to remove the cancer. They're lying. i tell you the truth. The Bible speaks of hell in language that makes me cry. Because somebody told me years ago, don't ever joke about hell because there are real people going there. I pray to God, not one person at the sound of my voice, would reject the resurrected Jesus and gamble with their eternity. Not one. That is why, my beloved friends, it is of uttermost importance that everyone at the sound of my voice would ask himself the question, if I die today, am I absolutely certain that I will be in heaven with the resurrected Jesus? Don't rest until you answer the question. When you come and see the empty tomb, you're not only going to see the incredible, unprecedented, indescribable humility on the part of Jesus, the Son of God, you will not only see the horrors of sin as God sees it, you will not only see that you're going to face mortality and you better start now, but when you come and see the empty tomb, you will see that only Jesus and only Jesus and only Jesus who rose from the dead never to die again can actually give you eternal life. You know, we know from historical record from the Scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ raised a lot of people from dead, a number of people. We only have a sample of them in the Gospels. One of them is Lazarus, who was there for four days, and people could smell that the body is decaying. He raised those people from the dead. Every one of them died again except Jesus. He rose from the dead, never to die again, never to die again, never to die again. And that is why he's the only one who can give you eternal life. The empty tomb is saying to everyone, Jesus and only Jesus defeated sin and the grave. Jesus is the only Jesus that shows you that his empty tomb is evidence of his resurrection. And all the so-called founders of other religions, listen to me, please, I plead with you, all those founders of other religions, they're dead as doornails. Only Jesus has an empty tomb. And that is why no one, but no one, no one, but no one, no religion, any religion can save you. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. Only the one who defeated death and the grave can give you life. The only one who has power over death can give you eternal life. If you're one of those people, 
Please listen carefully. I read statistics. I'm trained sociologically to read statistics, not just numbers, but the studies behind the numbers. And when I see and read these statistics, and they're more multiple, not just one or two, that says 60%, listen to this, 60% of churchgoers in America believe there are many ways to God. I'm not talking about the atheists and the agnostics. God knows how to deal with them. I'm talking about the people in the church. 60% of them, they said there are many ways to God. Please, please, please ask yourself the question, what prophet, what guru, what founder of a religion has defeated death? They are all helpless and hopeless and powerless in the face of death. How can they give you eternal life when they're all dead, dead, dead? How can a prophet promise you paradise when he's rotting in the grave? The evidence of the bodily resurrection of Jesus was not only recorded by many Christian eyewitnesses, upward of 500. But even Jewish historians, and as you know, they were not disposed to to Jesus. They rejected him. But some of the historians, one of them, the best known historian by the name of Josephus, he writes with details, evidences of the resurrection of Jesus and the impact that this resurrection had on the life of the apostles that they would happily die for Jesus. You don't die for a hoax. And that is why all of the apostles, bar one, John, they were tortured and they died horrible deaths and they did it gladly. Today there are many persecuted people around the world and some of them when they come to Christ, they're literally signing their death warrant and not death by the government, but death by family members. But they gladly embrace Jesus. I was with some of them last month in the Middle East. What courage. And when we look outside and see it raining, oh, we won't go to church today. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but I just want to wake you up. I want to wake you up. The first imperative is what? Well, some of you know, but... (laughs) He could read it. <laughs> the first imperative is what? The second imperative is once. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when you come to Jesus, when you come and see the empty tomb, you cannot be quiet. You cannot help but you want to tell. But it's an imperative that we go and tell. It's not a suggestion. It's in the imperative mood. You can't keep good news to yourself if you discover a cure to some illness. Wouldn't you want to shout it from the rooftop? Before I came to Jesus, I placed so many obstacles and objections. And, 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 and sometimes when the preachers are trying to corner me, I would literally go up on the roof and, and, and go to the neighbor's house and then leave outside when I see them coming. I, I, I hated preachers. Some of you are feeling that way right now. I forgive you. <laughs> because I know what it's like. So many objects, so objections, so many doubts, so many questions. Like these women, no doubt, they had all sorts of uh, things in their mind. You know, well, what about the soldiers? Uh, what about the Roman seal? Uh, what about the stone, this huge stone? These were all obstacles that these women were thinking about. But once the power of God destroyed all of these obstacles in my life and in my mind, once the stone of doubt was removed, once the soldiers of selfishness trembled and ran away, once the seal of my will and want to live my way was broken, once those obstacles and objections were removed, once you come and you see for yourself and experience the power of the resurrected Jesus, you cannot help but tell others. I began by talking to the pre-believers. 
Now, let me talk to the believers, those who have known Jesus and experienced Jesus year after year after year, and you're sitting on the good news. You have never shared it with anybody. I know fear keeps our mouth shut. I know that. I know that. But we don't have a choice. We are under obligation. We are commanded to tell others. Sadly, there are many people who have experienced that power in their life again and again and again. And yet, they never go to the second imperative. Go and tell. I pray that will change today. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians around the country and everywhere praying for a revival. I'm praying for a revival too, but I can tell you, if every Christian believer in America would share the gospel with one person, bring one person to Christ, we would have a revival. One, just one. Those who have experienced the removing of the stones of doubt in their lives, those who have experienced the breaking down of many seals that kept them away, those who, of us who have experienced the power in scattering the clouds of fear and selfishness. We have only one imperative left. One. Go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell the greatest news of all. Go and tell. The only news that's worth telling. People retweeting and retweeting and all kinds of stupid stuff and, 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 and this and that and the other thing on the social media and yet they do not share the greatest news of all. Death is dead. Death is conquered. Eternal life is now possible. And you can receive it when you receive Jesus as your only Savior and Lord. That you accept His payment on the cross to be for you personally, whether you're young or old. I can tell you categorically as I conclude that no matter what we have faced or what we will face, I just read this last week some great official in the United Nations. Now, I don't know whether he's exaggerating or not, but he said, starvation has begun in 33 countries right now as a result of the Ukraine-Russian war. I was reading all this, all this stuff that, that I read on, on a regular basis to stay on top of things. Whatever happens, nuclear war, starvation, whatever happens, whatever we're going to face in the future, we can face it with confidence. Why? <laughs> because we came and we saw the empty tomb because we have experienced the power of the resurrection in our lives, and therefore we are confident that because of the empty tomb, He will be with us in the middle of the floods and in the middle of the fires, in the middle of troubles of life, and that He will walk us through safe to the other side of glory. I'm conscious of the fact that a congregation like this, as I said at the nine o'clock service, there may be somebody who would have more questions and want to know more, want to be followed up, want more information. We have the most dedicated team of pastors in this church. And I tell people they are second to none, and many of them are going to be right here in the front to help pray with you, answer your questions. We're not asking you to come and join a church. No, 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 no. We are inviting you to come and surrender your life to Jesus. Then do whatever you want to do. Go wherever you want to go. Amen? Amen. Our loving Father, there is no way, and I've been trying for 55 years to praise you for my salvation. And I know that I'm joined with thousands of people who are filled with the joy of their salvation, the salvation that can only come from the resurrected Jesus. And Father, I am so glad we'll be, we will be spending eternity to thank you. But today I pray for that one person who has not received this incredible news, the good news of salvation. 
for those persons who have heard this for the first time. Father, I pray that you would open eyes, spiritual eyes, that you will unstop spiritual ears. And Father, I pray that because of decisions that are going to be made on the part of these, your people today, heaven will rejoice. New names are going to be written in the book of life. And I receive that by faith because my faith is in Jesus and is in his name that I pray. And all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Stand up and bless the Lord in a song.